Girls for hire, streets in desire, this dang cage, bringing that fire. Cold against the glow, dragon G flow, color master flow, falling like dominoes. Martial arts swift, can't even catch a breath. Danny Rand coming, better brace for the test. Solid as the night strike, quicker than a flash. In the shadows lurk, opponents turn to ash. Love ain't nothing with this power I yield. Iron fist rain, every battle I seal. Step aside, little Danny, steel skin ready. Harlem's own kingpin, hold it down steady. Bulletproof swagger, bad guy shatter, Luke Cage power, making villains scatter. Street level hero, roots running deep, heroes for hire. My word I keep, fists like boulders, crushing all foes. Power man here, everybody knows. Heroes for hire, justice they inspire. Cage and fist, take them higher. Street saviors, no kings required. Taking out crooks, leaving them retired. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Unspoken Issues podcast. 90s comics, that's what we're here to talk about. And I hope you are uh, here to listen about them too, because if not, <laughs> it's the wrong podcast. <laughs> Evan Bevins is right over there. What's up, Evan? You ready to talk some 90s comics? Always. All right. Chris Armstrong, he's going to let you know about the poll that we dropped, and then I will give the results. But we got to figure out what was going on in his head. Okay, so the poll was between Heroes for Hire number one from uh, 97 and Alpha Flight number one, which I think was the second Alpha Flight series, and that was also, I believe, from 97. So your your post for the poll says, in the wake of Onslaught, the Marvel U needed some heroes to pick up the slack after losing the Avengers and the Fantastic Four. Alpha Flight and the Heroes for Hire stepped up which of these number one issues should we discuss on an upcoming episode? And I'm going to do something I haven't done here in a while, and that is read the comments. Because <laughs> I don't do that uh, as often as I should, and I really feel bad because our listeners out there are great, and I love to see them interact, especially with the people from the Unspoken Decade. They're sometimes pretty vocal. Sometimes they have opinions. So let's take a look here before I get into the results. On the internet? <laughs> Trust me, Evan, it happens. All right? <laughs> it happens. All right. So Nate Jones, we know this guy, one Dean Compton, says, I remember pe- I remember people saying this Alpha Flight was great, but I've never gotten around to reading it. Well, we're not going to be. Oh, nope. I'm giving away the answer or giving away the winner. <laughs> nope, not going to say anything. Uh, Chris Armstrong, you chimed in with it was the first Alpha Flight I read, and I dug it back then. Evan says, oh, no, America lost two super teams. We'll just keep on protecting Canada on our own, like always. <laughs> is that an Alpha Flight joke? I Man, mean, ben. it. It, it just, it is, it is what it is. America's got like 47 super teams and, you know, okay, two of them disappeared and Alpha Flight's like, yeah, we're just going to, you know, great beast, master of the world, stuff like that. Yeah, we'll, we'll just, we'll hold the fort down up north. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At least Squirrel Girl helped him during the War of the Realms. <laughs> yeah. Well, Corey Lewis chimed in and he says, this, that was the issue that got me hooked on Alpha Flight. So those are our comments on the poll there. And I mean, my understanding is I, 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 both of these books flew under the radar for me in 97, not age of apocalypse. I was hooked on onslaught. You know, I read that clean through, I was collecting X titles at the time and I guess it was prime time to kind of throw in, Hey, it's a new book. It's a new team guys, you know, catch up what's catch up with what's going on over in with other teams that aren't, the the Avengers, which aren't the Fantastic Four. So granted, though, Heroes Reborn is coming out. Everybody's going to be reading about the Fantastic Four and the Avengers uh, when Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld are on those books. But aside from that, the poll results, according to what I see here, second place goes to Alpha Flight number one. And this wasn't a runaway. When you add the totals up from Twitter and Facebook, Alpha Flight came in with 29 votes while Heroes for Hire comes in with 33. So Heroes for Hire is the winner here, and that's the book we're going to be talking about tonight. Do you remember much about Alpha Flight, number one, or any of that series? I just remembered enjoying it. I knew that they had a mix of new characters and classic characters in that Alpha Flight series. You know, Guardian, 
I think is the name of the leader, and then Sasquatch and Puck were in there, and they had some new characters as well. I just liked that book. I followed it for probably 10 or 12 issues uh, before I think I kind of fell off. Same thing with Heroes for Hire. I was picking this up, at least for the early issues around this time, and also didn't stick with it through the end of the run, but I enjoyed what I read of it back then. When I was doing the poll, this is one I've always had in my back pocket that I thought would be a good poll. This is an era after Onslaught when the Heroes Reborn, Reborn stuff was going on and Marvel took the opportunity. From a creative standpoint, it, it makes sense. There's a big hole to fill with the Avengers and Fantastic Four and all those characters being gone. Obviously, they had the Thunderbolts and then they also had Heroes for Hire and um, uh, Alpha Flight that they could bring in. And I guess even publishing wise, those, you know, I guess technically Marvel was publishing those books, but the way I understand it, everything was being handled, you know, by Liefeld and Lee and their studios on the on the Heroes Reborn stuff. So oh, yeah. plenty of work to be had for, for these other Marvel creatives to giving them other stuff to do with these books. But yeah, Thunderbolt's the clear winner as far as the three <laughs> those three team books that were launching in the wake of Onslaught. But these two, I also enjoyed and thought they would be a good matchup for uh, to see what people preferred. I was just looking at the creative team on Alpha Flight number one. Stephen T. Siegel, I recognize that name, and Scott Clark, I definitely recognize that name. I usually, yeah. I saw him on Stormwatch, the early issues of Stormwatch. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I believe Siegel also got, if not got his start, at least did some work in the Wildstorm stuff in the mid 90s i think you're right because i'm pretty sure i want to say it's a grifter one shot some vertigo stuff didn't he yeah yeah he definitely did sandman mystery theater i knew i recognized this name sandman mystery theater uh and hawkman primal force he was on grendel number 40 from kamiko or comico however you want to say that and yes he was the writer on grifter one shot I, I knew i recognized that name and he goes on to do the ongoing grifter series as well he writes all 10 of those issues or at least yeah 10 of those issues he liked grifter he kind of stuck around there he did grifter in the mask so he wrote that evan alpha flight did you have any comments about alpha flight and and in that series or the first issue yeah i i got that one from the start thought i got every issue but then when i was cataloging comics a couple years ago i realized i had missed number 10 uh, oh, bummer. Tra- tracked it down at a local shop, though. I've always had an affinity for Alpha Flight. So, yeah, I followed that one start to finish. It, it had kind of like an X-Files vibe almost that, you know, these guys are working for the government, but the government was messing with them. Not everybody on the team is who they said they were or who they thought they were. Oh, and uh, yeah. And I did get I, I think I've mentioned it on here before my uh, high school graduation present. My mom took my best friend and me to uh, Chicago Comic Con in 1998. And uh, that Siegel and and Joe Kelly were writing X-Men at that point. And I got got this issue signed by Steve Siegel. It, it's a pretty dark cover, except for the white on Guardian's costume. And so Siegel signed it in red on Guardian's crotch. <laughs> really the only i mean it was really the only viable place to uh to, to sign it but uh, yeah that always that always oh. stuck in my head too i thought it was pretty cool it had a whole bunch of new characters in it and uh, really an, an interesting twist later once they figured out some of the conspiracies they had this government bureaucrat who was put in charge of department h it's actually a really nice dude like the perfect boss and you kept waiting for it to be revealed that he was a scroll or something you know he was just a good dude <laughs> all right the great closing line too without spoiling anything by the end of the series the roster had gotten pretty big and flex one of the new characters who was kind of a reluctant hero he goes to, to the boss and he's like well mr gentry what are we going to do don't we have too many people uh on this team and gentry says well flex that might be a problem if say someone was writing stories about us and people were reading about our adventures but since that's not happening we're fine with a big roster ah. A little bit of meta. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. That's funny. Well, you, needless to say, I, I voted for Alpha Flight. I did. Uh, do, you, do you want me to go into my Heroes for Hire experience? or? Yeah, go for it. I, I remember that, that coming out, and uh, I was intrigued, if for no other reason than the Hulk was on the cover. I hadn't known a lot about Power Man and Iron Fist. I just knew they existed. I didn't realize then how magnificent their original series was. If I had, I, w- I would have been all over this from the start. I got it. Some, I started reading it somewhere around issue 10. Um, and it, it, it was a, a budget casualty. But I remember the moment that made me quit was She-Hulk was guest starring. She did legal work 
for them. And uh, she made some comment where she looked directly at the reader and broke the fourth wall. And I'm like, look, that's funny in She-Hulk's book, but we don't need this happening in other books. <laughs> I don't know why that bothered me, but uh -huh. it did. And I was like, okay, well, I know which book I'm dropping. You know, so. <laughs> you know, it kind of fits in with the tone of the book in a way, because like, it's not so much present in this issue. I've been reading these Heroes for Hire issues for a month or so on Marvel Unlimited, pretty much since I knew it was going to be on the show. And not so much in this issue, but in the future issues, the narrator would often crack jokes and talk directly to the reader in a in kind of a jokey manner, in a way that I didn't really like that much, or I don't really like that much. But, you know, it's not, it doesn't bleed over into the actual story until, I guess, the She-Hulk thing, which I don't think I've... I don't think I've got to that point yet. Now, the real influence this had was it spawned one of my favorite Overpower cards. Okay. I don't know if you guys remember the Marvel card game Overpower, but some friends oh, of yeah. mine and I in high school were, were very much into that. And the Heroes for Hire card was flipping awesome. Eight strength, seven fighting, um, awesome uh, special cards. And the Hulk space took up two thirds of the Heroes for Hire character card. <laughs> oh, wow. That's funny. Uh, I was just kind of looking through the rest of the series here. John Ostrander is credited as the writer throughout this whole thing. All 19, 19 Although issues. he was not the guy originally hired to do it. I don't know if he pitched it or if he was asked to, to pitch it, but the original assignment for this went to the, and no disrespect at all to John Ostrander, excellent comic writer, but went to the one and only Roger Stern. Ah, Yes who is an awesome writer and an awesome guest at comic conventions. He was a regular at mid Ohio con in Columbus when I used to go up there and just a heck of a nice guy. I even got to interview him once for a story for free comic book day. Oh, nice. So, uh, that, that was pretty cool. But yeah, Roger Stern was the one with the original assignment. He developed the series and then plotted out the issue, but I guess hadn't done the script. And it said he had too many pressing commitments for the coming year. And uh, Heroes for Hire was the one that, that had to go. But uh, they brought in John Ostrander, who they said was great with juggling lots of characters in a mission-oriented setting from his days writing DC's fondly remembered Suicide, Suicide Squad. Squad. Right. But yeah, he wrote the original I issues of that. And uh, if you can't have Roger Stern, John Ostrander's not a bad uh, consolation. Ooh. No, not at all. I mean, Roger Stern, my goodness, the legacy that he has writing comics. If you pick up an Avengers issue from the 80s, it's a possibility that you're going to be reading some Roger Stern stuff. Very good possibility. Not he only was, that. He I mean, was always center square at Mid-Ohio Con's Holly, uh, comic book squares panel. <laughs> nice. But yeah, you, you can't beat that. So Roger Stern on the plot, John Ostrander on the script, Pasquale Ferry penciling. And I should just real quick do a look up for that to find out who if he's done anything else um I'm yeah he has a long career i don't know what he had done before this if anything um but he and i really like his art in this series he, he, around the mid 2000s he took over ultimate fantastic four for a while and i noticed in that run that his art he was definitely doing a lot of computer elements with his art i don't know if he had, had started drawing digitally i don't know if that was even possible at that point in time, but it definitely had a lot of computer effects and digital coloring. And, and I didn't like that artist style as much and his more recent stuff, like he did that Namor mini series from a year last year. And I think now he's doing Dr. Strange. It's kind of reminds me of the difference between the nineties art of now I'm struggling to remember the guy's name who did, he does a lot of okay. Star Wars stuff. Uh, Salvador La Roca. That's ah, oh, there it is where I really liked his pencil art, you know, in the 90s, early 2000s, but now it's all super digital looking and I don't like it very much. And that's kind of how Pascal Ferry seems to be to me, his more modern stuff. And it, I'm sure it's easier. I'm not saying he should, you know, be trying to, to suit my preferences. But, right, uh, right. But I like, I like this era of his art uh, a lot and not as much now, but... Yeah, he is 63 years old. Mike's Amazing World of Comics has him starting, though, in 93 with Plasma. Yeah. So that, But that's the earliest thing they have him on, unless he was going under a different name or something like that. But he did all four issues of Plasma. And, I mean, really, Heroes for Hire happens in 97, so about four years after that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, looks like he's a Marvel guy for quite a while. Skips over to DC there at about... 
um, in the 2000s and then comes back to Marvel, just like you said, doing the ultimate Fantastic Four. Uh, so, I mean, he does a good job. Mm. And then we have Jamie Mendoza on the inks, Jonathan Babcock on the letters, Joe Rosas on colors. And there you go. I know I see Joe Rosa's name a lot when it comes to colors in the 90s. He rose for hire, number one. I, I'm going to throw something to you here, Chris. Set up. You already said some. there's a big event that happened. Why don't you kind of tell everybody and let them know what this big event that happened occurred and kind of give them an idea of what Onslaught meant to the Marvel Universe. <laughs> yeah, well, the Onslaught was the big one of the biggest 90s, you know, comic crossover events for Marvel, kind of born out of the X-Men franchise. Onslaught was this big villain that kind of rose up and the Avengers, Fantastic Four, pretty much all the Marvel Universe, Spider-Man, you know, Doctor Strange, everybody was kind of teamed up to deal with this big threat that Onslaught presented. And it sort of ended with um, a lot of the main superheroes that were not mutants kind of sacrificing themselves seemingly to defeat Onslaught. The reason the mutants didn't do it is because if they tried to sacrifice themselves in the same way the human characters did, it would have only made Onslaught more powerful because he was a, a mutant as well. See, I thought so, it was yeah, they because all, the X-Men books were selling better. But yeah, <laughs> that was the creative was reason right. given. <laughs> But so, yeah, so a lot of these superheroes disappear after this big cataclysmic fight in New York City, where most of Marvel's characters are based anyway. And it left a big void for superhero protection for the citizens who were probably terrified that they just lived through this almost cosmic level battle in their backyard. The people who saved them from it all died <laughs> in the wake of it. And the mutants were kind of blamed for everything afterwards, too. So nobody wanted to trust the X-Men to save them. That's sort of where this this kind of sprung from, this Heroes for Hire series. Right. And if you get a chance, go back into the source material archives. Should be able to find me, Evan, Chris, and Mark Radlich discussing the whole four volumes of the Onslaught epic from September of 2019, episodes 239, 241, 242, and 243. We read them for you. But it's some work there. Yeah, we did. Massive, massive storyline. So you can kind of check that out and then come on back and check this out while you're at it afterwards. All right. Let me pull up the synopsis here for Heroes for Hire number one. At the high-tech prison known as The Vault, a routine prisoner drop-off ex escalates into a full-scale prison break, orchestrated by a group of villains under the command of a mysterious figure who believes their actions will save the world. Or at least the mysterious figure definitely believes that. Meanwhile, Danny Rand, a.k.a. Iron Fist, learns of the prison break during a training session and shares his concerns with Jim Hammond, the original Human Torch. Danny is particularly troubled as the security system at the vault, which failed, was his design, or at least part of his design. And he's worried about society's reaction also following the onslaught event that led to many heroes disappearing. You want the people to feel safe, and Danny obviously feels responsible here. In the desert, look like the desert, the Hulk is ambushed and knocked unconscious by the UFOs made up by Vapor, Ironclad, Vector, and X-Ray. Vector places a small disc on the Hulk, claiming him now as their property. In New York, Luke Cage is enjoying a movie on Broadway when Iron Fist approaches him, seeking his help to reassemble the Heroes for Hire team. Cage declines, leaving Iron Fist worried that his plan actually may fail without Cage's involvement. At a United Nations symposium, the UFOs appear with the Hulk, following their orders to disrupt the event. Across town, Hercules gets into a bar fight, but is drawn to the U.N. building upon seeing a news report about the Hulk's involvement. Iron Fist also heads to the U.N. and finds White Tiger in the utility room. Not the White Tiger he used to know. She has followed him, seeking his help to end the hostage situation. As they reach the end of an air shaft, they see the UFOs have attached discs to all the scientists there. Before White Tiger and Iron Fist can act, Hercules bursts in, engaging in a fight with Vapor. White Tiger and Iron Fist join the battle, with Iron Fist confronting the Hulk and destroying the control disc on his neck. Enraged, the Hulk disperses Vapor with a thunderclap and aids Hercules in defeating Ironclad. Vector orders a retreat, claiming they have acquired the data that they needed, and it's time to get out of there. 
The heroes attend to the scientists as the media arrive, reporting that the UFO's involvement here are the same villains that apparently were involved in the vault prison break and revealing that the controlling discs seem to be that were made by the controller, a very prominent Marvel villain. In an interview, Iron Fist announces that the heroes for hire are back, offering their services to those who can pay for a nominal fee. Uh, despite Iron Fist's invitation goes to, to charity, it does go to charity. It does go to charity. Despite Iron Fist's invitation, though, the Hulk declines to join the group, leaving White Tiger, Iron Fist and Hercules right now as the core members. Elsewhere, it is revealed that the UFOs are actually working for somebody called the Master of the World. That's an interesting villain name who plans to manipulate Rand and the heroes for hire. And that is how we end issue one. Evan. Real quick, the Hulk is here, but he's also in the Heroes Reborn universe, right? That is correct. I, I had forgotten that that was the version of the Hulk we got because in the climax of the battle with Onslaught, the Hulk punched Onslaught so hard that he was separated from Bruce Banner. And right. the Hulk was unconscious and Bruce kind of wandered into the big energy stew where all the other heroes were supposedly dying. So, yeah, the Hulk was leaping around without any Bruce Banner to uh, tell him to calm down. Yeah, there's a lot of mention about how the Hulk is seems to be less predictable. He's not as predictable as he used to be. Less controlled, I guess is the best way to put it. It seems to be a little bit more violent, and he absolutely seems to have his wits about him. This is not Hulk smash. He's able to form complete sentences, which is kind of what I thought was different. Uh, I wasn't expecting him to be as cognizant as he is, because he's like, now you guys are going to pay for what you did to me. And you know, I oh, think okay. at this point... Pre-onslaught, he was the uh, kind of the professor incarnation the professor. of the Hulk, which at that point was billed as the body of the Savage Hulk, the mind of Banner, and the emotions and attitude of the Gray Hulk. Okay. So, but now there's no Banner in the equation. Got it. All right. Vapor. Uh, not to be confused with Vapora, who was a villain from my <laughs> – from the, from the Daredevil um, – don't be huffing gasoline comic book that I read. <laughs> Not the same, although she looks pretty similar. Uh, probably so, distant cousins. Distant cousins, I'll agree. Um, but There was probably a, in Power Pack or something like a Vapor War crossover. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Vapor Wars parts one through six, I remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the first issue of Heroes for Hire. I am... Uh, you know, I'm perfectly pleased with what I got here. It's very similar to X-Men 2099 where, hey, come join the team. Now nah, I'm good. Luke Cage, of all people, <laughs> is like, nah, nah, you know, I've done this before. I'm not interested. But when you look at the cover, Evan, what do we have on the cover? Yeah, not unlike some characters in another recent episode, X-Men 2099, people in this one did not pay attention to the cover. Uh, right. On the cover, we see not only Luke Cage standing with his old pal, Iron Fist, but the Hulk. Clearly billed as a member. Uh, whoever was designing the Heroclix card certainly thought he was going to be <laughs> along for the ride. And uh, the Black Knight, who is definitely teased as showing up next issue. Right, right. Yeah, White Tiger, who this is a different version of White Tiger. So I assume, unless you guys know different, this is her first appearance, right? This is the, the only place I ever remember her appearing. Okay, all right. I mean, she's got a better look than the White Tiger that I'm used to seeing in Marvel Snap. She's got that ninja kind of look to her full body suit with some crazy looking claws. Danny doesn't trust you, her. Go ahead. Oh, do, do, do you want to know where she came from? I do. She was a creation of the High Evolutionary. Really? Yeah. And she was actually an evolved tiger. <laughs> okay. All yeah, right. Yeah, that comes up in uh, one of the, maybe the second or third issue or one of the earlier issues. Yeah, she's kind of loses control and starts to transform into a tiger. So at, at first you're like, wow, her speech is you're trailing behind the Hulk. But then when you consider that she was actually a large cat, it's, it's pretty impressive vocabulary. <laughs> starts to make a little sense as her first appearance. Yeah, there wasn't a, a white tiger at this point. That's a character that Marvel or a title that Marvel revisits every few years. So this is her first appearance here. She first appeared. Yes. Heroes for Hire number one, May 1997. Okay. There was a time when new characters were introduced, you know, in first issues or in other titles instead of in one shots um, to set <laughs> yeah. up the next year's worth of stories. Right. I mean, I'm trying to think of what else really kind of stands out to me here. There's mention of Onslaught quite a few times, you know, because they're obviously that's the whole kind of goal of this 
team is to be out there. Danny obviously feels like, hey, I want the public to feel safe. And that's why he's in front of the media saying, hey, we're out here. We can protect you for a nominal fee, charity donation. And, you know, seeing uh, let me ask you this, Chris, were, were the UFOs the ones that did the prison break at the vault? You mean in this issue? Yeah, because I'm looking at this issue, and I mean, it says it at the end. Or, or they're, they're in the guys. The media, yeah. okay. All right, so that's what confused me. I was like, that is not those guys. What is going on? <laughs> okay, so there you go. Makes sense to me now. So they definitely were the people at the vault. Mystery solved. Okay, all right. Well, Chris, I'm going to go ahead and let you go here. What are your thoughts here? Uh, yeah, this, I mean, this is a pretty lengthy one, 41 pages listed here on the Marvel app anyway. It's a lot of stuff going on. I do like Perry's art in this. And something that's even more obvious if you're reading it on an iPad with the smart panels or whatever mm -hmm. is that early, or I should say the late 90s digital effects that they were using in a lot of comics right around this time is really obvious. And sometimes it looks goofy and, and dated. Uh, sometimes it actually does work and, and looks cool. But there's something about it that is almost nostalgic at this point because <laughs> yeah. they've advanced so far past a lot of this. It's kind of like seeing shaky CGI in some, you know, early movies that like it doesn't look great. It's not perfect, but there's still like a charm to it almost. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, yeah, there's a lot of the computer effects in this stuff. This was kind of the first book that I ever really read with Iron Fist as far as like him being a regular character. I'm sure I had read several he guest starred, you know, and in the past before this point, but. Same thing with Luke Cage. I did have a couple of issues of Cage, the 90s solo book he had, but I didn't keep up with it. So it was kind of cool. I had known through trading cards and maybe Wizard Magazine or whatever that Power Man and Iron Fist were a tandem that were a big deal in the 70s and maybe into the 80s. But now I got to see them together, which is cool. I always kind of get a kick out of the UFOs showing up, mostly because... They were in one of my favorite Darkhawk comics. I think it was Darkhawk number six, where Captain America and Daredevil and Darkhawk teamed up to take on the UFOs. I think they were mostly Hulk villains, right? Is that right, Evan? Yeah, no. I, I got the feeling they were kind of like, if you needed someone a little more threatening than the Wrecking Crew, you brought in the there UFOs. Yeah, that's the, right. they, they were like the, the utility players of, of Marvel villains. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we, we need somebody who's a bit more threatening than the Wrecking Crew. How about the UFOs? <laughs> Yeah, they haven't appeared in, like, three issues. <laughs> I like the updated Hercules and Luke Cage costumes for this series. Like, on the cover, Cage has got his yellow shirt. But in later issues, he has, more, I think it's like a white or maybe even a silver shirt. And he still has the tiara, the silver band around his head. But a little bit of an updated night. And this is an attempt, I guess, to modernize Hercules' look. I don't really like his traditional look with the green bands. Like, I think most people who like Hercules, they want that classic Hercules look. Right. I don't really like the early 90s Avengers, you know, Hercules costume either. But I think this is a, an attempt to kind of update his look and be a little less cringy, I guess, from some of his older costumes. I like this Hercules look, of course, 80% of his appearances at this point are, are, are just him in the standard green costume that he has. The only other thing I really had specifically, I'm kind of scrolling through to see if I can find it in this issue. It's when Hercules is in a confrontation with this guy who he's trying to steal this guy's girl, I guess. And that looks an awful lot like a puffy shirt. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the uh, puffy shirt from Seinfeld. Seinfeld and the always one of and pointy ears. Yeah, oh. he does seem to have though. Maybe he's an elf, and maybe that's why Hercules yeah. has got his radars attuned to him. I was getting some North Star vibes, but they wouldn't have been fighting over a woman. <laughs> yeah, that's right. true. Yeah, yeah um, it's, it's funny that guy behind shoes too. Oh yeah, <laughs> now, what's funny that, that dude's story? <laughs> Straight out of the seventies, like he's been at this bar. Since the 70s, <laughs> trying to find somebody. And that guy behind him, too, like, you know, this the big bulky guy. He, he thinks yeah, he's I, I, I mean, I, I assume that he thinks he's got a, a shot at this girl, too. <laughs> this is classic 
Hercules right here. This is the way you introduce this character. He's yeah. going to get into a bar fight because he's, you know, he's macking on some woman. He's drinking a lot. And I mean, my goodness, if you weren't going to say this, a generous soul, he wishes to share with me the gift of battle. <laughs> and I, I was like, I've heard that before. Um, the gift of battle. That's a you great know. line. Now, I'm curious about the dude behind him because he's got that massive belt buckle and is not as fancily dressed. They don't look like guys who would hang out together. I, I kind of want to know their backstory now. What in the world is he picking up and hitting him with? Like, is it a drink tray? Look kind of like, who knows? Maybe it's just a table. Okay. Like a little glass table. Who knows? He's, yeah, there's drinks flying from it, it looks like. And, eh, of course, you know, it's made of glass. But anyway, yeah, I love how he just takes both of them and yoinks them out the window, which by the way, I thought was a little bit higher. When you look at that window, I'm like, Oh crap. He threw him out of the skyscraper. No. They're- and then the manager says what, like it was the third time this week you've thrown someone through a window here. <laughs> Would not let Hercules back in. I mean, fool me once. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this is a great way to introduce Hercules. Go ahead, Chris. I interrupted you. I like, we have the guardians who, you know, obviously they're guarding the ball, but, it seems like a lot of times the writers they're they're using the guardians to make the villains look threatening, and then it's the UFOs who are used to make the heroes look powerful because they can beat them, even though, you know. So it's kind of the standard, you know, characters you throw in there to to make somebody look good or whatever, and then you kind of build up from there. But right. Um, also, like Jim Hammond, who is the original Human Torch. This is probably the first exposure I had to him as a character, although I did know about the Human Torch being – the original Human Torch being an android and stuff from probably trading cards again or something like that. But he is a key character in this series. and Oh, really? That was cool to have him – you know, a, a, a big part of Marvel history, you know, as part right. of the cast here. But yeah, I think that's pretty much all I got. I liked this issue. This is a, a cool – a cool series, I think. The fact that Vapor is able to take down the Hulk, that's pretty impressive, but I'm sitting here thinking, like, the other person that fought the Hulk that beat him by using gas was Batman. I remember... Oh, yeah. I think Hulk either had him in a bear hug or something like that, and he ended up... I could clearly see Batman used some type of a gas. It got into his lungs, and it was Batman versus the Hulk. And I'm pretty sure it was that crossover, and he ended up knocking the Hulk out with whatever gas they use. So that's how you beat the Hulk, I guess. I'm trying to think of when I did Hulk thing, hard knocks. Oh, that was forever ago. That was like my second episode ever for source material, if I remember right. But I think they used gas in that one too, to take him out. So, you know, he's not all invulnerable on the inside. That's right. The inside. All right, Evan. You can also up, diffuse man. a situation involving the Hulk with a box of puppies. Oh, really? <laughs> no, that happened. That happened. <laughs> Squirrel Girl? Uh, no, Indestructible Hulk by Mark Wade. As soon as I saw a box of puppies, I mean, everything stops right there. I'm playing with some puppy dogs. <laughs> All right, Evan, you're up, man. What'd you think of the issue? Oh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I, you know, it reminded me of what attracted me to this this series to begin with, which was, you know, me. I I like the C list characters or the the odd assortments. I mean, what kid reading comics didn't go? Oh, you know what would be cool is if you put like Sleepwalker and Darkhawk and Gambit and you know that Rintra dude that hangs out with Dr. Strange on a team. You know, that's, that's kind of what this reminds me of. It's taking people from all different parts of the Marvel universe and putting them together. I, I don't know if we mentioned it in the synopsis, but the heroes for hire is, you know, basically owned by the Rand Meacham corporation, which is now a subsidiary of Oracle, which is owned and led by Namor. Oh, right, right, right. And so I think in the note at the back from the editor, he mentioned that, you know, Iron Fist had been killed off at the end of the original Power Man and Iron Fist series. And John Byrne brought him back in the Namor series that established Oracle and established him as like a corporate powerhouse. And so that's how this came about. And then, of course, uh, Jim Hammond was his ally in the invaders from World War Two. So I I assume that's how how he, he got in there. So it's just weaving all these strands of Marvel together black knight i remember him when i first learned about the avengers black knight was a key figure there and then it, like chris uh, luke cage and iron fist were i had learned about them from trading cards and references and other comics so this was my first real exposure to them and yeah just the idea i mean it used to be the idea of the hulk on a team was just crazy and now he's just a 
regular Avenger. He attends the meetings and everything, probably has an ID card. But that used to be pretty unusual. Even despite the defenders, they were just kind of like, oh, yeah, the Hulk's here. Make sure he's not breaking something. So, yeah, just that whole idea of bringing together all these disparate characters and really showing the Marvel Universe in an organic way. You know, this obviously sets up the master of the world. And I think there's a reference to Iron Fist saying like he had made a poor choice or talking about the impending return of Kun Lun. Yes. Which was supposed to be accessible from our reality in the year 2000. Can you get that sound clip from Conan O'Brien's old show? (laughs) I remember that was something that actually wasn't resolved when the series ended and they came out with the Wolverine and Iron Fist limited series. Basically, the the return of Kun Lun wasn't going to be a good thing. And Iron Fist and and Wolverine had to deal with that. Yeah, I wondered if that was going to be the long game there because they made sure to mention that. It was so long that it outlasted the the series. But yeah, (laughs) I, I remember... A friend of mine in college who who had read Power Man and Iron Fist, uh, I lo- loaned him these issues, and uh, that was we, we exchanged Christmas gifts, and I got him the the Wolverine Iron Fist series so he could figure out how that played out. Nice, um, but yeah, they, and then I think eventually Scott Lang, Ant Man, showed up in this. Always had a soft spot for him. So it's like Ant Man, but not the original. <laughs> you know me, I like the guys who came second and third. You know, oh, the yeah. U.S. Agent and Thunderstrike and <laughs> Scott Lang. Ben Riley? Yeah, I, I did not so much. <laughs> eh, eh, eh. Well, uh, oh, you, you, know, so, you totally derailed me there, Armstrong. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's always worth it if it gets a Ben Riley reference in. So I, I think it's annoying when people just try to ravage a podcast by shooting <laughs> oh, in a character. Um, oh. But, you know, I mean, teach his own. Teach his own. I did appreciate now, I wouldn't have gotten it then, but the. On page 16, I'm not picking a panel, I'm just saying I like this, where they, they have the flashback talking about Danny and Luke's partnership, and it's, you know, that a classic Power Man and Iron Fist cover recreated there. Oh, yeah. So those, I mean, like, like I said, I, I'd heard about them. I finally read some in The Essentials, and oh my goodness, those are some of the most fun comics I've ever read. Yeah, a long time ago, uh, it was a few years back, I just did a one-off reading the first time Iron Fist met Luke Cage. I think it was in, in promotion of the series. So the Defenders was getting ready to drop on Netflix. And I will tell you that that was a really cool way of introducing both of those guys together. Um, I, I wish I could remember who was on art. Help me out. Do you remember, Evan? Was Claremont writing it then? Because Claremont and Byrne did a lot with Iron Fist. I just know Hang the on. panels were just etched in my mind because all you see, like Luke Cage has went into this you know, this apartment building or something. And he's acting pretty aggressive like he does. And the only thing you see, like he looks in a room and it's just black. And then all of a sudden iron fists, fists start glowing. That's like the next panel. And then he walks forward and then he just punches, he punches Luke through a wall or, and it's just, it's great. And I I was like, Oh man, this is going to be good. Yeah. Issue 50 where the power (laughs) series, Yes, yes, it was a good issue. Uh, <laughs> uh, revered across species lines. But yeah, uh, Power Man and Iron Fist number 50, where Iron Fist uh, joined the title, was uh, written by Chris Claremont, drawn by John Byrne. Okay, all right. Well, yeah, it was captivating. And I don't, you know, I don't journey into the 70s very often. This is the this is the late 70s, if I remember correctly, right? Like 70, yeah. 76, 77, something like that. But uh, man, it had me hooked. They They were doing a great job. Oh, yeah. And I mean, th- there was one I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my favorite issue. Just one of those comics. I'm glad that it exists. I think it was Power Man and Iron. Yeah. Yes. Power Man and Iron Fist number 85, where the heroes for hire are hired to go undercover as long haul truckers. Uh, <laughs> because the mole man has been pulling tractor trailers underground in the Midwest. Oh, wow. Written wow. by Dennis O'Neill. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, you know, yeah, my- and, and Luke's, you don't get much of it here, but Luke's got a secret in this series, too. Okay. So you, you got the heart and soul of the heroes for hire, these longstanding friends, and they both have stuff they're hiding from each other. Oh, really? Yes, indeed. Wow. Setting up the drama. I wanted to say that 
Pasquale can draw a big guy. <laughs> <laughs> the whole book's oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I'm not going to say that it's you know, our Adams esque, but it's big enough and expressive enough for the Hulk when he gets punched in the back of the head by Iron Fist. He's popping that disc off the back of Hulk's head. And, you know, anytime that he's kind of looking at the bad guys, he knows he's going to wreck some stuff here in a few. We can go ahead and get into picking the panels. I did love how. Well, you know what? I'm not going to say that because I have a feeling somebody's going to pick it. If somebody doesn't pick it, I'll talk about it here in a few moments. But other than that, I mean, yeah, this is we're getting our team together. We got some people that we invited. They decided not to do it. And uh, Black Knight hasn't showed up yet. So we'll find out what's going to happen here. So the the, the world needs heroes, folks, for a nominal fee. <laughs> sure. uh, let's talk panels. So, Chris, you went last last time so i'm going to give you first shot here yeah i'm gonna go with page i think page four or actually i guess it would maybe be 30 but it's the panel with the iron fist using his iron fist to smash that disc on the back of hulk's neck and you can really sense the motion and the power of the punch and everything pretty pretty cool a lot of cool images in this book i think but that's probably my favorite you think the hulk's going bald there is he going bald yeah. <laughs> he's, like he's, he's got a bald cut. Bald. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. I mean, geez, Jesse, you get punched in the back of the head by Iron Fist and see how your hair looks. I think I have been, <laughs> apparently, the way my hair is growing. <laughs> Evan, I'll let you go next here, man. What do you got? Mine is actually the page after Chris's where Hulk disperses vapor with a classic Hulk clap. Yep. The thunder clap. And then, and then you got Iron Fist and White Tiger just trying not to get blown away. The one after that where Ironclad realizes the Hulk's not on their side anymore is pretty good too. <laughs> if I compared this art to Joe Mad, am I am I far off? I can see it. Okay. I feel maybe quite as, I don't know if clean's the right word. I, I don't know. I just, it doesn't feel quite as, as clean as, as Joe Mads, but, but I mean, I can definitely see the resemblance. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you guys didn't pick the one that I was going to talk about, and I'm going to pick it. That is the history that Hercules is regaling all of these beautiful ladies with about how he was a member of the Avengers, and we get a very classic looking. Hercules and this one page splash along with the rest of the Avengers, you know, silver surfers there. Photon Captain Marvel. Who is she at that point? She's Captain she was Marvel, known though. as both in that costume, I think. So, all right. So in black Knights there, human torch, I think Reed and Silver. Black Knight is in this issue. I just realized. Oh yeah. <laughs> He's in the splash page. He's in uh, cameo. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah. And it looks like he changed his art style up. Uh, for this page a little bit. In my opinion, it looks like he, it's a little bit yeah. more structured and a little less anime. It's probably the best way to put it. It looks great. And it's fun to watch, you know, let me tell you, ladies, about the time <laughs> I spent with these great heroes who are now gone. I mean, most of these, all of these are gone, right? Like all yeah. of these heroes are gone. Silver Surfer, though. Silver Surfer and Namor are still around. Okay. All right. Those Hercules. Oh, yep, yep. He shows up at some point, I think. <laughs> Big H on his belt, just in case you didn't know. I, I have no idea if this is intentional, but I mean, Hercules is a good guy. I especially like his appearance in the early Avengers run from some of the essentials. That's where I really got to like Hercules. So he, he is a good dude, but he does have a bit of an ego. So, of course, he's in here twice. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if that was a conscious decision, but it totally makes sense that in this classic assemblage of heroes, Hercules is in there twice. <laughs> you got a good point there. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we did it here. Any other last thoughts on Heroes for Hire? We get into plugs. All right. Well, yeah, this has been our coverage of Heroes for Hire. Let's go ahead. We'll talk about what we have been into here recently. And Evan Bevins, I'm going to shoot it to you first here this time. What do you got going on over there on Asterisk 51 and any other shows that you've been popping up on? Well, at asterisk51.blogspot.com, if you like 90s comics, I'm working my way through the Amalgam Marvel and DC crossover mashup issues right now. I also did the complete 25-issue run of Secret Defenders. You can find there, and there was a time that Captain America turned into a werewolf. As far as Heroes for Hire go, I haven't delved as much into that as, as I would like, but back when the Moon Knight series came out, I did take a look at one of the most memorable adventures of Moon Knight that I could recall, which was in an issue of Power Man and Iron Fist when he got stuck in a water tower. <laughs> oh, man. True story. 
Jesse and I also have been known to talk once a month about the mobile game Marvel Snap. That's right. And uh, we'll have some new issues of Snap material uh, dropping soon. I don't just read comics. I also watch movies based on comics. Mark Radulich and I, not too long ago, discussed Bulletproof Monk, the comic that shares a name and not much else with a 2003 movie starring Chow Yun-Fat and Sean William Scott. Wow. That was on an episode of Comic Stripped on the Red Electric Broadcasting Network. Yeah, good stuff right there. So, okay, Chris Armstrong, what do you got going on over there at Small Screeners? Took me a second. <laughs> I got there. I've got a podcast I do with my buddy AJ where we talk about direct video and made-for-TV uh, movies. So some recent episodes include Stephen King's The Night Flyer, John Carpenter's Elvis, TV movie he made in the 70s, late 70s or early 80s with uh, Kurt Russell. And also Steven Spielberg's first movie, the 1971 made-for-TV movie Duel, about a guy in an intense, additive uh, situation with a semi-truck driver on the desert highway. Oh, man. Scary stuff. I already knew. I mean, you said what the list was going to be, which was top Kurt Russell characters. And like, there oh, was yeah. no doubt in my mind what your number one was going to be. <laughs> Not a single doubt. I honestly thought, well, he might shoot for the thing, but I think I know what he's going to go for. I was correct. Ego. It was, yes, it was ego. It's in the reflexes. <laughs> the old pork chop express. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. I, yeah, I'm catching them all over there on the uh, small screeners. All right, now I better get through my plugs and see if I can remember the shows that I do. Yeah, right here. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably listening to the source material feed, which is granted to us by one W2Mnet.com. So please feel free to check out the other podcasts that they have over there. They have a lot of great podcasts. Radlich guys are obviously a part of that. They have a video game podcast that they do. It's video games to the max. As for me, you got the unspoken issues right here. We talk 90s comics. It's me, Derry, Dean, Evan, Chris. Sometimes Matthew Price says, you know what? I'm done selling comics for the day. I want to talk about comics. He comes on and he does it. So you can listen to that. We're talking 90s comics all the time. And then you can check out the Source Material Comics podcast where we talk about any era of comics. And recently we are in our third part of our coverage of Greg Rucka's Lois Lane comic book which is enemy of the people returning the gag reel. Mark Radlett should be happy. I'm glad that uh, he gets to hear that. And as far as other appearances go, I will be on the, the MCU's bleeding edge and I'll be talking star Wars, the nice. acolyte. Mm-hmm. Oh man. Star Wars, the age of apocalypse. Check it out. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll be, I don't know much about star Wars, but Jeff seems to think that I contribute a little bit to their show. So he's like, man, we're doing the acolyte. I'm like, okay, put me down for episode two. I'll watch two episodes and then I'll come on there and talk about it. So already I've, I've heard some bad things, especially that apparently there was a fire in space, but not uncommon for star Wars films. Just letting you know, (laughs) just letting you know. Did you volunteer for that because you thought it was about Magneto's group? I did. I was expecting there to be Exodus involved was not. Turns out I was mistaken. Happened to the best of us. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, feel free. Check out the MCU's Bleeding Edge. And what was the other thing I wanted to promote here? Go check out the YouTube. That's what I want to talk about. You know, where Evan and I have been streaming some Marvel Snap. So feel free to check out source material, the YouTube. And you can also find old episodes of Unspoken Issues on there, too, I think. I think I have a playlist. All right, we're out of here. That's Evan Bevins. <laughs> That's Chris Armstrong. I'm Jesse Starcher. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you later soon. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Unspoken Issues is part of the UnspokenDecade.com, the home for 90s comics, blogs, and podcasts. Unspoken Issues also has a Facebook group you can join if you are interested. Just search the Unspoken Issues podcast and request to join. All of this would not be possible without W2Mnet.com so make sure to seek them out for more podcasts. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please feel free to share and we look forward to entertaining you again soon.